The Grand Army of the Republic's clone commandos were elite clone troopers that served under the Special Operations Brigade during the Clone Wars. These Special Forces soldiers were noted for their superior equipment and training. The commandos did what no average Jedi or clone trooper could do. They were assigned to special missions that were almost impossible to complete. They were the best of the best, and possibly second only to the Republic ARC troopers, depending on who you may ask. Clone commandos essentially served as the GAR's version of the United States Navy SEALs. You wouldn't see them in a platoon on the front lines of battle, but rather completing the most dangerous and covert of missions. So let's talk about what makes the Republic's clone commandos so special. The clone commandos were created as a response to the need for a highly specialized and adaptable unit that could operate independently in small teams without the aid of a larger unit or Jedi general. The Kaminoan cloners recognized that traditional clone troopers were not suited to every type of mission that the Republic would need to carry out during the war. While a large company of CTs would be suitable for a straight march into battle, what would happen when, say, a hostage required rescuing behind enemy lines, a droid factory needed to be sabotaged, or a key separatist leader silenced? To create the clone commandos, the Kaminoans selected the best and brightest clones from Jango Fett's genetic template and subjected them to an intense training regimen. This training was designed to develop the clone's teamwork skills, adaptability, and combat prowess. Once they were fully trained and equipped, the clone commandos were assigned to carry out high-risk and covert missions that other clones were not capable of undertaking. They were often sent on missions behind enemy lines, where their small team size and superior training and equipment gave them an advantage over larger groups of enemy soldiers. In terms of their role in the wider Clone Wars conflict, the clone commandos were one of the Republic's most valuable assets. Their ability to carry out difficult missions with a high degree of success often made the difference between victory and defeat for the Republic. They were also highly respected by their fellow clones and were seen as some of the best soldiers in the entire Grand Army of the Republic. The clone commandos were equipped with a wide range of specialized weapons and equipment, which helped them to carry out their high-risk missions and operate effectively in a variety of harsh environments. First and foremost, the clone commandos were equipped with the DC-17M interchangeable weapon system. The DC-17M was a lighter and more versatile version of the DC-15, which was standard issue for your typical clone trooper. This improved blaster rifle was incredibly versatile and could be reconfigured into a sniper rifle or an anti-armor grenade launcher, depending on the mission at hand. The DC-17M also had a built-in sound suppressor, which made it ideal for stealth operations. The DC-17 proved a dangerous weapon against the CIS on countless battlefields throughout the galaxy, from the sandy deserts on Geonosis to the bright lights of Coruscant and the forests of Kashyyyk. In addition to their primary weapon, the clone commandos also carried a variety of other weapons and tools. One of the most iconic of these was the Vibroblade, a type of energy sword that was used for close quarters combat. The Vibroblade could deliver a devastating strike and cut through almost anything, making it a deadly weapon in the hands of a skilled commando. In addition to a conventional Vibroblade, clone commandos also used a retractable gauntlet Vibroblade, which was built into their armor. The clone commandos were also equipped with a range of explosives, including thermal detonators and detonation packs. These weapons could be used to destroy enemy vehicles or infrastructure, or to create diversions that allowed the clone commandos to carry out their missions more effectively. In terms of equipment that was more specialized, the clone commandos had access to a range of gear tailored to specific mission types. For example, they often used jetpacks to quickly navigate through difficult terrain or to escape dangerous situations. They also carried grappling hooks, which could be used to climb walls or access elevated positions, and various types of sensors, which allowed them to detect enemies or hidden danger. But sometimes the best offense is in fact a good defense, and that's where a clone commando's armor comes into play. While well, your typical Republic clone trooper was equipped with fitted plastoid armor, both in its phase one and phase two stages, clone commandos were issued Katarn class commando armor. This is a heavier and far more sophisticated armor, which could withstand far heavier damage. The armor shared its name with the Katarn species, which was native to the homeworld of Kashyyyk. 
and were among the first clones to customize their armor with individual paint jobs. Their helmets contained a built-in tactical display and a full spectral night vision. The best tool for a commando truly came in the form of their brothers. Commandos would be organized into squads of typically four or five. Each individual commando would then specialize in a specific skill set, such as hand-to-hand -hand combat, marksmanship, or demolitions. They were a piece of a puzzle rather than a rounded one-man army like an ARC trooper. Clone commandos are first mentioned by CT-411 or Commander Pons during the first battle of Geonosis in Attack of the Clones. Pons tells Mace Windu, Sir, I have five special commando units awaiting your order, sir. That is the sole mention of the commandos in the films, but their true gain in popularity came thanks to the 2005 Republic Commando video game. The tactical first-person shooter sees the player control Sergeant Boss, the leader of Delta Squad, which also consists of second-in-command Fixer, who was an expert slicer and codebreaker, Sev, who was the squad's most skilled marksman, and finally their Scorch, the explosive technician. While the Republic Commando game's story, as well as accompanying series of novels, has been labeled as Star Wars Legends, don't worry, we'll get to that in a moment, Delta Squad were officially canonized in Season 3 of Star Wars The Clone Wars. In Episode 14, Witches of the Mist, Delta Squad recovered the bodies of Jedi General Halsey and his Padawan Nox, following their deaths in the massacre on the planet Deveron when Count Dooku unleashed his new assassin, Savage Opress. Delta Squad bring the two Jedi's remains back to the Jedi Temple on Coruscant, where they're met by several members of the Jedi High Council. Obi-Wan Kenobi, Plo Koon, Adi Gallia, and Sacy Tin. Boss tells them that the entire military force on Devron had perished, leading the Council to suspect the emergence of a new threat to the Jedi Order. We know that Scorch goes on to serve in the Galactic Empire, appearing briefly in the Bad Batch Season 1. Right up there with Delta Squad is Captain Gregor, who served in the Foxtrot Group, which fell under Obi-Wan Kenobi and Commander Cody's 212th Attack Battalion. Gregor fought in the Battle of Sarish, one of the Republic's most devastating defeats, with many clone troopers perishing in that battle. After covering the escape of his brothers, Gregor was reported as missing in action before being discovered on Abafar by Colonel Mieber Gascon and D-Squad. The commando had severe amnesia, with no recollection of the war or his life, aside from being a dishwasher for a shady restaurant owner who just took advantage of him. Gascon used an image of Captain Rex, who Gregor had befriended at some point to jog his memory. The clone commando returned and helped Gascon and D-Squad to escape the planet, sacrificing himself in the end. But for the second time in his life, the clone commando cheated death and survived. Sometime after Order 66, Gregor defected from the Galactic Empire as they began to phase in TK stormtroopers, which were conscripted soldiers rather than clones. Gregor would be rescued by Clone Force 99, and after a shootout with Scorch and other commandos, he escaped. Gregor then went on to reunite with Rex and Commander Wolf to fight in the Rebellion. Clone Force 99 themselves, aka the Bad Batch, are an interesting case as one could make the argument that they could be considered as clone commandos. After all, they are a smaller squadron that went behind enemy lines, each member had their own specialization, and they used the same blasters and gear. However, as Hunter explained to Gregor, the Bad Batch didn't use the designation of CC or RC for clone commando or republic commando, Rather, CT-99, which stood for Defective Clone. While Clone Force 99 operated essentially the same way as a Delta Squad, for example, they weren't considered to be one and the same. The clone commandos featured in Star Wars Legends take things even further. There's so much lore to explain, we could have talked about it for this entire video. Legends commandos were trained by a group of 100 elite training sergeants chosen by Jango Fett, of which 75 were Mandalorian mercenaries. As such, many commandos were taught the way of Mandalorian culture and felt a strong attachment to it. The first generation of clone commandos were selected from the regular clone batches and then segregated into pods of four effectively forcing them to depend on each other and work together in order to survive. During their training, commando squads were often pitted against each other during combat sessions. These clone commandos were even trained in live-fire exercises, giving them a sense of the reality of combat, long before the regular clones who trained with stun rounds. Anti-terrorist training was also conducted in a building nicknamed the Killing House. 
Though many commandos failed to survive their exercises, the rest learned rapidly, allowing them to become better soldiers. However, the loss of squad mates was felt by any commando who lost their brother. The commandos also experienced near-death torture to train them in resisting interrogation, and many clones were left mentally scarred from the experience. By the end of the commandos' training, the Kaminoans were very pleased with the results. Although unfit to fight on the battlefield as infantry soldiers, nor capable of performing complete solo operations like the ARC troopers, the clone commandos nevertheless demonstrated themselves as a new breed of warriors that few could challenge. Neither the regular clone troopers or even the elite ARC troopers could match the clone commandos in organization and teamwork. Legends commandos were even more armed to the teeth than their canon brethren. While also customizing their armor, many squads would opt for improved camouflage, as was the case with Omega Squad, which wore matte black armor, and Yayak Squad, who wore gray splinter camouflage. Throughout the Clone Wars, there were many different opinions about the commandos. Some clones were impressed by the commando status within the GAR and were awed by their skills as a special forces unit. Other clones, specifically the ones belonging to the infantry-based units, disliked the commandos and felt that their reputation was grossly exaggerated. Later in the year, many clones grow to even hate the commandos for their attachment to Mandalorian culture. When the rise of the Empire began, the newly christened Imperial Commandos received a new set of armor and later employed a similar division titled Storm Commandos. As such, many remaining ARC Troopers and Imperial Commandos were incorporated into the 501st Legion as a new Special Forces unit placed under Darth Vader's direct command. In addition to their new role as Jedi Hunters, the Imperial Commandos were also tasked with tracking down and killing anyone who either sympathized with the Jedi or aided them in any way. Another objective that the Imperial Commandos took on was to hunt down and exterminate clone deserters and traitors mostly former Republic Commandos and Rogue ARC Troopers. Among the first to compose the ranks of the Imperial Commandos were the remaining members of Delta Squad and Omega Squad, respectively. Although still capable at operating in the field, due to their combat experience as veterans of the Clone Wars, one of their primary tasks was to train the Empire's newly engineered Clone Stormtroopers. As previously mentioned, not all of the Republic Commandos chose to obey Order 66, a small minority of commandos disregarded the command from the highest level of Republic authority, either out of sympathy for the Jedi Order or due to different personal reasons. For instance, a portion of Omega Squad fled in exile to Mandalore due to the influence of one of their trainers, Sergeant Kyle Scarada, who introduced them to Mandalorian culture. Omega Squad's commandos had been harboring thoughts of desertion for some time, prior to Order 66. In another instance, the Republic Commandos of Ion Team regarded Order 66 as an invalid command and refused to execute their Jedi officer. But unlike the deserters who retreated into hiding on Mandalore, Ion Team was unable to escape from the Empire's wrath. With the 501st Legion behind him, Darth Vader confronted Ion Team and personally killed two of its members. The remaining two commandos were captured alive by the 501st. But that about does it for our breakdown on Clone Commandos, the Republic, and later Empire's version of the Navy SEALs. But which do you prefer, Clone Commandos or ARC Troopers? Let us know in the comments below. Perhaps a full-length ARC Trooper video is also in order. If you did enjoy, make sure to click the like button and subscribe if you are new to join the Red Squadron. Until next time, thank you so much for watching, and may the Force be with you. Red 5, standing by.